So, two important measures of inequality of the Lorentz curve and the related Gini coefficient. Let's start off with the Lorentz curve. Um, to draw the Lorentz curve, we start with one of these diagrams here. We've got the cumulative percentage share of national income and the cumulative percentage share of population, or population rather. Um, so, if um, we distribute income absolutely evenly, so everyone has the same income, will be on this 45 degree line here. So this line here represents perfect equality because say we have 100 people in the population, the first person earns one pound, the second person earns one pound, so that's two pound altogether, cumulatively, the third person earns a pound, that's three pound. You see by the time we get the 50th person, they earn a pound, so we're gonna be on this line at a cumulative percentage share of national income, 50%. So this keeps on going. So if you're on this line, everyone earns the same, the same wages. And I should point out, you can use the Lorentz curve and certainly the Gini coefficient to illustrate wealth and also consumption inequalities. But we're going to focus on income inequality, which is how it's usually used. So um, if we draw the Lorentz curve, then it would look something like this. So it hangs below the 45 degree line. And the further it hangs below the 45 degree line, the greater the level of inequality. So you see here that the first 50% of the population probably have about, would you say 25% there, of national income. And the, the other lot have the rest, 75%. Okay, so it's a pretty unequal society. And then a, yet a more unequal society would be a Lorentz curve, something like this. So this country here, country B, would be more unequal than country A because we're further away from the 45 degree line. Okay, so the Lorentz curve is very useful because it gives us a visual indication, a visual impression of inequality. However, um, to be a bit more precise, we can actually measure this using what we call the Gini coefficient. So the Gini coefficient just measures the area A divided by A plus B. So this measures how far away by area we are from the 45 degree line, basically. Now, we're quite complicated calculus equations for measuring this, but for the purposes of this level, we'll just stick with a fairly simple equation which can be illustrated, which is basically A, the area A, divided by A plus B. Okay. Um, if we were actually on the 45 degree line, okay, then we'd have perfect equality. So it would be area A would equal area A plus B, it would be 1 divided by 1, which would give us the answer 1. If we had perfect inequality, would kind of have an inverted L shape Lorentz curve like that. So everyone apart from one person would have nothing and one person would earn everything, all the income, or if we were measuring wealth, all the wealth would be theirs. And so that would be perfect inequality, which would be zero on the Gini coefficient, okay? Because the Lorentz curve would be completely flat until that point there. So basic rule is the Gini coefficient varies between 0 and 1 and the higher the Gini coefficient the greater the inequality in society the lower the Gini coefficient the greater equality in society perhaps one of the most equal societies um, in the world currently are Norway about 0.24 and perhaps one of the most unequal societies um, on the planet is probably South Africa at 0.65. Um, the Gini coefficient for the UK in 1979, before Margaret Thatcher was elected Prime Minister and introduced various market-based supply-side policies, was 0.25. By 1990, it reached 0.34. Okay, so if you have a welfare state, if you have progressive taxes and you redistribute from the top to the bottom, what would it do to the Gini coefficient? it will lower the Gini coefficient, which is kind of the reverse 
of what was done in the 80s. So from the post-war period in Britain, the Gini coefficient Im improved, it fell, and currently the Gini coefficient of the UK is actually about 0 0.35, 0 0.34, and it has improved has improved from a peak of 0.37 around about 2008. However, the Gini coefficient does have a few problems in terms of measuring inequality. First of all, it, it doesn't actually show the standard of living, of course, of a country, the extent of development, or the level of absolute poverty. So you could have a very poor country um, with terrific levels of absolute poverty with the same Gini coefficient as a very rich country. Um, so it doesn't indicate um, the style of living, the level of development, of course. Uh, secondly, um, it doesn't show the actual income distribution. So theoretically, it's possible to have 50% of the population in abject, absolute poverty with nothing, no earnings, and the, 50%, the other 50% with everything else. Um, that would come out um, as 0.5. Um, so it doesn't show the actual distribution of income, but it gives an indication, of course. And the third sort of criticism is if the poor remain at the same level of poverty but the rich become poorer then the Gini coefficient will actually increase, will reduce, will fall and will improve and so the level of absolute poverty course will remain the same so it's not measure, it, all it does is a kind of measure of relative poverty and, and, and an indication of inequality Another simple way of measuring inequality, which Wilkinson and Picard use, is to use the ratios. It's just to compare the top 20% of earners, what their average earnings are, compared to the bottom 20% and what their average earnings are. And a country like Japan is about four of the top 20% compared to the bottom 20%. So that's an alternative measure of inequality used by the researchers Wilkinson and Picard, but we're at the spirit level. So I hope that's useful. Thank you for watching.